This is Research Like a Pro, episode 149, Germans in St. Louis during the Civil War with Heidi Mathis. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Research Like a Pro. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing today? Good. I'm excited to talk more about Missouri and Germans with Heidi. It's always fun to jump into a new location where we haven't really researched or a time period in that location that we haven't researched. But before we get to our episode, let's talk a little bit about all the fun we've been having this week reading our study group members reports. Have you been enjoying that? I have. It's hard to only spend a short amount of time. I want to really dive in and just spend an hour on each report. (laughs) But when we have so many, we can't do that. I have really noticed that this particular group, not that previous groups didn't have great reports, but I have just really enjoyed the variety of research topics and the variety of localities and time periods. And I just feel like we are getting better as genealogists. You know, the citations are great. Explanations are good. The research is good. So it's just been a pleasure reading through these reports. It has. Well, we have got our guest on with us again today. Heidi Mathis is here. Hi, Heidi. Hello. We've been enjoying working with Heidi as one of our family locket genealogists and in our study groups. And she's been writing for us about researching Germans in Missouri specifically. And our previous episode, we talked a lot about why the German immigrants were coming into Missouri at this particular time of 1840, 1850, 1860. And obviously this is the time period right before the Civil War and during the Civil War. So Heidi, just tell us a little bit about the impact that all of these German immigrants had on Missouri during the Civil War. It is interesting to think about what happened. You had this state that was a border state during the Civil War, and it was very evenly split between pro- Union and pro-Southern forces, and you just had this huge wave of Germans coming in that kind of tipped the state towards the North. And by looking at the situation, we can kind of see how the differences really couldn't be worked out and how those just kind of reveal the tensions in the Civil War. And one way to do that, if you can, is to be able to look at individuals in this period. And the Missouri State Archives had a photograph of this woman, Euphrasia Pettis. And she was written about in this book that I had read called Abolitionizing Missouri, which talked all about this situation where you had all these Germans coming in. And the woman who wrote the book, her last name is Anderson. And she was the one who introduced me to this character, Euphrasia Pettis. I looked her up and Euphrasia was born in 1839 in Missouri. And her father had been a veteran of the 1812 war. And his name was William Grimes Pettis. He had migrated from Virginia to Missouri. So he was one of the, those wave of Missourians who had Southern roots, who had been also pouring into Missouri in the very early 1800s, they brought their pro-slavery economy and mindset to Missouri. This Pettis family was enumerated on the St. Louis 1860 census. You know, at the time they were enumerated on the census, St. Louis had gone from a handful of Germans earlier to, by 1860, there were 22,534 Germans out of a total population of 77,860 St. Louis. I just began to wonder, what did the Pettis family feel about suddenly being swamped by all these Germans? And in the book, she had found a quote that said from the pro-slavery newspaper, The Leader, quote, these people want to revolutionize our political system, vote away our property, and banish our Negro population from our territory. So you can see there was a, a kind of a war of words going on in St. Louis at this time. Right, because we had talked in the previous episode about how we had German newspapers, and then 
we've got these pro-slavery newspapers, so you've got these two factions fighting it out. I think it's really interesting that you brought up the point that these early Missourians came in mainly from the slave states. And I know there were some that came from other areas, you know, that maybe came down from Ohio or Illinois or Indiana that maybe were not pro-slavery, but there were a lot that were the Southerners. And especially because they were bringing their slaves with them, they were looking for that new land, new plantations. So of course, we're going to have a culture clash and have a big split. Absolutely. And the tensions were just rising in general as, as things got closer and closer to the Civil War. I wanted to ask you more about the book, Abolitionizing. Um, did you just pick that up because you were learning more about your German ancestors? Exactly. You know how you do genealogy, you kind of get one little fact here and one little fact there. And actually, what was making me think about this was my husband has his great grandmother was one of these people just like Euphrasia Pettus. They had owned slaves and had come from North Carolina and Virginia and had gone through Kentucky and Tennessee. And I actually remember on a podcast of yours, Diana mentioning that, and it just got me thinking about the whole bigger picture. And so when I read that my ancestor Burkhard Schlag had joined this Civil War regiment, and I it got me thinking, like, why did he do that? He was married, he had two children. So I got this book, probably just started Googling around Germans and St. Louis and Civil War. And this book came up and it was a, I thought it was a really well done book. And she had done a tremendous amount of research of reading all of these German language newspapers to really get an idea of what they were thinking. And so it just brought me right into the mindset of, of Germans in St. Louis at that time. That's really cool. I think that's such a good idea that as we research our ancestors and as we have questions, that we can then turn to the field of history where they have done a lot of that research in newspapers and more of the study of historical movements and things like that, where we can get a broader sense of maybe what it would have influenced our ancestors' actions. Absolutely. I've always loved studying the Civil War and just thinking about that time period. Um, and so this was just an excuse <laughs> to read more about it. <laughs> so I looked up the book on Amazon and I'll put a link to it in the show notes in case anyone else wants to take a look. But it's, is this the full title? Abolitionizing Missouri, German Immigrants and Racial Ideology in 19th Century America. That's the one. Great. Okay. I'll put the link to that in the show notes. I studied history in college and we read a lot of things like this in my Civil War course. And there's a lot of books that you can read out there that are by historians that are focused on specific times and places like this. So it's a really good example of what's available for us to read and study if we look beyond the typical genealogy and reference books into historical books. Absolutely. I love that. All right. Well, let's continue on with our second character. You know, we got our character, Euphrasia, and she was a typical Southerner. What about a German? Well, I happen to know one. <laughs> We're going to be talking again about my little ordinary third great grandfather, Burkhard Schlag, who came to St. Louis in 1854 from the German state of Hesse. And like I was saying, right when the Civil War started, he was already married and had two children and he owned a saloon. I didn't know too much more about him than that. And that's why I had gotten this book, like we were saying, and wanted to learn more about what was going on. In the, in the previous podcast, we were talking about how when the Germans arrived, they weren't particularly super anti-slavery, but over the course of the 1850s, they became just gradually more and more radicalized to being very, very pro-union in St. Louis. And in the book that we were talking about, the author, Kristen Lane Anderson, she speculated that the St. Louis Germans may have been uniquely more pro-union because St. Louis was the city farthest south with the largest population of newly arrived Germans. And Anderson argued that for the most part, Germans everywhere blended in with attitudes around them and were no more or less anti-slavery than their neighbors, except in St. Louis around this period of the Civil War. Anderson thought that the St. Louis Germans would have been around slavery and its tensions more regularly, and this may have provoked them into picking a side than Germans who lived in a city further north like Cincinnati or, or Milwaukee. She read a great number of German language newspaper sources in English and in German, and she argued that from 1854 onward that St. Louis Germans were progressively radicalized up through the Civil War, as I was saying. And so 
how did I know which side my little guy Burkhard took? Well, there were two reasons. One was that I found his muster roll card for the fourth volunteers of Missouri. And the second was that he named his third child Julius Sheridan Schlag after the Union General. So I've always wondered if Philip Sheridan was in St. Louis and if my little guy ever heard him speak. <laughs> <laughs> what it was that attracted him enough to name his son that because I'm pretty sure Julia Sheridan Schlag was the only one that ever lived. <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> well, I know that we talked a little bit in the last episode, kind of hinted at the Camp Jackson affair and that that was a big deal in St. Louis. So let's talk a little bit about that. This is when all the tensions that we had been talking about between pro-Union and pro-slavery, between German and native-born Americans boiled over the control of the St. Louis arsenal. President Lincoln was reputed to have said, quote, I hope to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. So for him, keeping the border states out of the Confederacy, like Kentucky and Missouri and Maryland, it was super important to him to keep them out of the Confederacy. So he tried not to push them too hard. Border states like Missouri and Kentucky occupied strategic territories that were vital to the execution of the war. They usually sat on evenly divided populations, which made their control really tricky. So in the run-up to the start of the Civil War in April of 1861, St. Louis had become an armed camp. There were pro-Confederate Minutemen. It had basically divided into factions, armed factions, and The pro-Confederate ones were called the Minutemen, and the pro-Union ones were called the Wide Awake. And there was a newly elected pro-Confederate governor called Claiborne Fox Jackson. Then at the federal level, shortly after Lincoln had taken office in March of 1861, he had replaced the previous pro-Confederate general with Nathaniel Lyon, who was an uncompromising anti-slavery New Englander. So he was a literal Yankee. And all over Missouri, the tension was just rising and St. Louis was a tinderbox. So at this time in April, the Civil War had just started on April 12th at Fort Sumter. And all eyes were really shifting to the St. Louis arsenal. The arsenal was the fourth largest in the United States, and it was the largest within the bounds of a slave state. Around mid-April, Governor Jackson asked the Confederate President Jefferson Davis to begin moving large and small arms to near the arsenal, and probably in order to seize it. This was a crunch point to decide who was going to control this arsenal. Not only was it important to control the arsenal, the weapons, it was really important to control this strategic place on the the Mississippi River confluence, because the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the Illinois River all meet there at St. Louis. So whoever controlled St. Louis was really going to have the figurative high ground in Missouri for the war. So Burkhard likely read this German language newspaper and Zeiger des Westen, as I was mentioning before, his funeral announcement was in it. So that's why I think he probably read it. And then Zeiger had this stridently pro-union editor who was the 48er that we talked about last time, Henry Borenstein. And throughout the winter and spring of 1861, this newspaper was printing article after article exhorting Germans to help preserve the Union. And on April 19th, so just about a week or so after Fort Sumter, Burkhard probably read this. I imagine that he did. And just to let you know, Fatherland refers to the United States and not to Germany. But these, this was printed in German, and I'm just going to read in English here. But it says, not more words, but weapons will decide. We ourselves can enlist bayonets and cannons, commanders and regiments. We will certainly do it and will place our whole legion at the service of the fatherland and under the command of the president. Every doubt, every question is now untimely. The fatherland calls. We stand at its command. No German fit to carry arms will fail to defend his freedom and his fatherland. So I found that in the Missouri Historical Review. It was a January 1948 article, and I kind of just couldn't believe how strident it was. But it really explained why this married man might risk everything and join this regiment to to protect his new fatherland. As you were talking, it reminded me of how in my Missouri course we talked about the Civil War and how there were two seats of government because this Confederate governor, 
decided to set up his own government for the Confederacy over the state. And then President Lincoln had appointed this new governor who was part of the union government of the state. So they had two centers of government, which is crazy. So it was very interesting when you talked a little bit about that. But I agree that that newspaper article just, wow, that really incited everyone, I'm sure. And also I was thinking about Burkhard, that if everybody else in the neighborhood was joining up, I'm sure he would too. It was the thing to do. They wanted to defend their rights. And that was really interesting. Did you translate that yourself? I did not translate. This historical article had a translation of it. Actually, I tried to find it in Zeiger in German, and I was not able to find it. So if there's anyone out there who can, <laughs> love it. <laughs> That's nice that they had it in the article already. What did you find out about the response of the St. Louis German community to this call to arms? Right in this period, the first four Missouri volunteer infantries were formed and they were almost entirely German. And then a week or two later, there were 10 regiments and they were 80% German. So the Germans were really well represented in this kind of response to this threat on the arsenal. So on May 1st, Governor Jackson, he called up his pro-Confederate militias for maneuvers just outside St. Louis, and they set up what they called Camp Jackson. And it was just a little less than five miles from the arsenal. And the Confederate President Jefferson Davis had already delivered heavy weapons, or he was delivering heavy weapons, by May 9th. And so on May 10th, Captain Lyon, who was the one appointed by uh, President Lincoln, marched 6,000 of these troops out to Camp Jackson, and they captured the 669 pro-Confederate militiamen. And as they were marching these captives back through St. Louis, angry pro-secessionists shouted and they threw rocks at the mostly German troops and were reported to have said, damn the Dutch. Dutch is a, a common misnomer of Deutsch or German. And so eventually the tensions got high enough that shots were fired at the Union troops and they fired back and all in all, 28 people were killed and 75 were wounded in the city that day. So obviously this was a, a traumatic event for everybody. And, you know, as I thought about Euphrasia and what she was living through because she was enumerated on the 1860 census, so she was likely still there in 1861, she and her pro-secessionist neighbors were probably really alarmed to see all these foreigners who stood on the opposite side of the Civil War. People who she probably viewed as not having the same right to be there as she did, because they had just arrived. But she wrote this letter to her sister on May 20th, so very shortly after this event. And she succinctly summed up the feelings that many Missourians must have felt after these mobilized immigrants forcibly swung their city to the Union. Quote, my blood boils in my veins when I think about the position of Missouri held in the Union at the point of the Dutchman's bayonets. So later that summer in 1861, the St. Louis Arsenal and St. Louis were firmly in Union hands. There were more skirmishes and things, but by the summer it was all over with. And when I've heard of popular histories of the Civil War, you don't hear too much about St. Louis but it was a very strategic place on the on the Mississippi River. Instead, we have often heard a lot about Vicksburg, you know, and that huge siege that happened there. And I guess the reason we don't hear about St. Louis is that unlike Vicksburg, St. Louis remained uncontested for the whole war. And it was partly because of these newly arrived Germans. I like to think they had a small part to play. <laughs> That's neat that you, you can relate with your ancestors and cheer them on as part of the <laughs> position you would have liked to have held back in the Civil War. That's, that's fun. Wow. And I love the letter, um, Euphrasia. That's neat that you found that and that you can kind of use that to help you understand what people were thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I just couldn't believe it when I when I saw that. And I got that little quote from the book, Abola abolitionizing. So she she had found that. But then I was able to find her picture and this letter, the actual letter in, I believe it's the Mer Missouri State Archives. Maybe we'll get a link to the actual place you can find it. But as Diana has been saying throughout her series, Missouri is just a fantastic place to have ancestors in. There are so many great archives. And I think the St. Louis County Library is just 
a phenomenal resource because they have like dedicated people there who can answer your genealogical questions. And I have, I have hit them up many times just with questions on how to find different record sets. Well, I think this has been such a fun episode. I like diving deep into some of these things that we don't know much about. And I think it's a really good example of how you took this ancestor you knew nothing about, you discovered what side he was on in the Civil War, and you discovered all of these things that came into play and that swirled around him and his family. And it really brought you closer to him, didn't it? Absolutely. I have just an absolute soft spot in my heart for Burkhardt. I I later found a little passport application for him and it gave a little description of him because I don't have any photographs. And it described him as being 5'3 and having blue eyes and under nose, it said large. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love that. that. And I just, I don't know. It just, it got me. Um, and it's true. I do have pictures of his children and they, my, my great, great grandmother, she did have a big nose. <laughs> And so um, oh, anyway, I, I just imagine my little Burkhart with having a big nose. So anyway, I, I do think that it is really fun. Most of our ancestors were very ordinary people, but understanding what they went through helps us understand history so much more, not only their history, but the history of our country. And, you know, sometimes our, our ancestors were on the side we'd want to be on now, and sometimes they were not. All of those situations helps us think about American history, hopefully in a more honest way. Yeah, I like that. I think regardless of our views, we can learn so much from history, putting ourselves in the shoes of our ancestors and thinking about what they would have faced really helps us to have some good perspective on our own challenges, right? Oh, 100%. I actually sometimes prefer thinking about history than what's going on in real life today. Sometimes it's a little more comforting just to go back and see the same tensions being played out and see how they were dealt with and how they were overcome. It gives you hope that we can overcome the challenges that we have today, just like these people were able to overcome some of their challenges. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Heidi, for coming on and teaching us all about the German immigrants in St. Louis and about the Civil War and the Camp Jackson affair. I think even more than the history was just the lesson that there's always more to researching our ancestors. We may have found the records, we may have found the relationships, but do we really have a window into their souls? And we can figure that out by learning about everything that happened around them and finding some of these published sources where other people have written. And maybe our ancestors didn't have a letter or something in the newspaper, but other people did. And they maybe had very similar thoughts as their neighbors. So lots of food for thought from this episode. So thank you again. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. So I did go ahead and find the picture and letter of Euphrasia Pettis. So I'll put those in the show notes. They were found on the Missouri Historical Society website. Thank you. (laughs) Which is not a surprise because as we discussed in one of our recent Missouri Repositories episodes, this is the historical society that is located in St. Louis. Yeah. I've been totally just blown away by, I I feel so happy that my grandfather was born in in Missouri, just because (laughs) I've enjoyed their archives so much. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, thanks, Heidi. And thank you to all of our listeners. We'll talk to you guys again next week. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide, on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our Research Like a Pro online course or join our next study group. Learn more at FamilyLocket.com. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our e-course or study group. If you like what you heard and would like to support this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.